welcome to the Katie Helper Show. I'm your host, Katie Helper, and I'm joined every week by my co-host, Gabe Pacheco. You can hear the Katie Helper Show every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on WBAI. That's 99.5 FM or WBAI.org. You can also find us on SoundCloud and iTunes where you can rate and review us. Don't forget that we count on your support to bring you our weekly shows. To do that, just go to patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Today's episode of the Katie Helper Show is really exciting. It's a double header, double whammy. We bring you two interviews. They're both really important. One has more of a local focus and one has more of a national one. First, I bring you my interview with Reverend Kader El Yatim. He's a candidate for city council in Brooklyn's 43rd district. He's also a Lutheran pastor, Arab American, proud immigrant, socialist, father of four. Then we bring you a debate over the best way to achieve universal health care between Dr. Adam Gaffney and journalist Joshua Holland. Interestingly enough, Reverend Kader El Yatim is endorsed by the Democratic Socialists of America. And you know who else is running for city council and received the endorsement of the DSA? Glad you asked. Jabari Brisport. And you can see Jabari at our next live taping of the Katie Helper Show, which will be Monday, September 18th at 7 p.m. at the Brooklyn Commons at 388 Atlantic Avenue. As always, it will be followed by karaoke. So we're so excited to be talking to Reverend Kader or Khader Al Yatim, who is a candidate for city council in the 43rd district. He is your typical Lutheran pastor, Arab American, Palestinian born, proud immigrant, father of four, city council candidate. I know there's so many of those, so it's hard to keep up, but we're really excited to be talking to him and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Can you tell us a little bit about what made you get involved in the campaign? Well, I always been engaged and involved in the community. I served in community board 10 for 12 years. I served on many different boards, many different organizations in the neighborhood, such as the Arab American Association of New York. But during the last election, it is where I became more engaged and involved and inspired by the Bernie Sanders campaign and the platform he was talking about. And he was able to motivate me, uh, engage me, speaks about issues that are relative, relative to me. And after the election of uh, Trump, uh, I became very alarmed about the rhetoric that's coming out from the White House. And when the seat became open, I wanted to be engaged and involved in a bigger, higher level. And I decided to run for uh, city council so we can uh, bring a, a bold, inclusive leadership to the district where I felt it was missing in the past uh, many years. And can you tell us a little bit about what you were doing up until now with your life? Well, uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, I am a Lutheran pastor uh, who decided not to be only a minister to his church, but also to be a community activist and leader and organizer. So uh, all my life in this community was about building bridges, bringing people together. I reached out to my Muslim brothers and sisters, as well as my Jewish brothers and sisters, and we formed together something called Unity Task Force. Uh, and the whole idea of it to come together around the table to know each other as neighbors, but to work uh, on issues of concern in the community and uh, respond to them collectively. So that has been very, very important initiative in the community, especially after the events of 9-11, where we came together to continue to keep uh, the peace and the harmony in the community, but also to make sure no one in our community will be attacked, harassed, or victimized for the language they speak or the way they look. Uh, so that, that's really a part of my legacy in this community. And in terms of your campaign, I was just looking at your kind of some of your issues and you're committed to better transportation, making transportation more accessible, protecting seniors, cutting red tape that prevents seniors from accessing government programs and benefits and leading the fight against prescription drug price increases, keeping your neighbor, the neighborhood affordable, fighting illegal conversions, establishing programs to help victims practice addressing untenable rent costs for small businesses, advocating for citywide affordable housing plan that is actually affordable, public safety and better policing, advocate for resources for local precincts and end all unofficial ticketing quotas to stop for-profit policing, pass the right to know act and supporting new immigrants. And, oh, this is interesting, increased funding for 
ESEOL, English for Speakers of Other Languages. We, we need to make sure uh, we are providing the resources for people uh, so they can learn English, they can assimilate, they can get engaged, they can get involved. And by creating these opportunities, actually, we are empowering uh, immigrant communities uh, to, to thrive. And uh, I think uh, providing these resources will be extremely important to that process. Great. And where did you learn English so well, by the way? Well, when I came to uh, uh, this country, I spent the first year uh, studying English, wow. so in Philadelphia. So can you tell us a little bit about about your early life, I guess, and your trajectory, how you even came to the United States? Well, I uh, was born and raised in Bethlehem. I'm a Palestinian uh, from Palestinian origins, and uh, I was born and raised there. In 1992, I was sent to the United States to be a mission developer to start the first Arabic-speaking Lutheran congregation in North America, and I was brought to Brooklyn. Wow, uh, I didn't realize that. That's really cool. That, that yeah. Was... yeah, so, so that's uh, uh, why I came to the United States, is, is to reach out to the Arab Christians who left the Middle East and came to the United States and called the, the United States their new home. And many of them came to Brooklyn, and I was sent here to minister to them. Before that, you had been ministering in Bethlehem, or? Yeah, I was uh, 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 working at the Bethlehem Bible College, uh, but uh, I came to the United States uh, in 1992. I went to Philadelphia. I, I finished my master, uh, Master of Divinity. Then I came to Brooklyn in 1995. And is there a large Lutheran population in Palestine? Uh, it's not very large. Uh, there is a couple of thousands, uh, and we have uh, a lot of families left because of uh, the poor living conditions uh, back home. Right. Uh, because of, uh, you know, we, we live under the Israeli occupation. That's one. E economy is very bad. There is no security. And uh, people just leaving the land to look for a better future for their children, which is very sad reality. And that's where, when the church realized that uh, the people who were moving here they did not have a home, to, to a spiritual home. And that's why I was sent here. Wow, that's great. And how does being Palestinian influence your politics or your worldview? Well, you know, I, I was born and raised uh, under the Israeli occupation. All my life I lived in a home where I was always sheltered and protected, not to go outside after dark, uh, always been watched when I go out and come in, when I go to school. You know, the situation was always uh, dangerous and it can change in a split of a second. Uh, so, but uh, when I was at the age of 19, I was actually arrested by the Israeli uh, soldiers and was in, imprisoned. Uh -huh. uh, for almost two months. Uh, and that experience really impacted my life and made me ask the question, why this is happening to me? Uh, why this uh, injustice? Why this pain and suffering? Why, the, why I have to be in a prison uh, with, when I, I know I did not do anything? And when I came out from prison, I really committed my life and myself to work on issues of justice and peace and to understand the behavior uh, of the other and why they try to act in such a way. And that's why I wanted to be in go engaged in, in dialogue and to know uh, uh, the other. And I actually, uh, since then, I've been engaged in, in many peace conferences where Israelis and Palestinians come together to engage each other about the occupation, the uprising, what's happening back there, and how we can work collectively together uh, try to bring some sense and some understanding in the chaos of what's happening back home. Great. And what were you arrested for, if I can ask? I have no idea. I was picked up from my bed at three in the morning. Wow. I never was given any reason. And I was released after 57 days without knowing why I was arrested. Oh, my gosh. And your parents, uh, your family, I assume they were not told what had happened. How did they? What? Ha yeah, I mean, well, they just this, didn't need see, to give any explanation. Home, yeah, back home, really, I mean, for the first 18 days after my arrest, nobody knew where I was. Uh, I did not know where I was. Wow. And uh, no lawyer will come visit you. The first time I saw my lawyer, uh, it was after 18 days. 
and the lawyer was only to come say hello, uh, bring you maybe a change of clothes where I was not allowed to use anyway. Wow. And, but uh, there is no court, there is nothing. I, I was in a small cell uh, in uh, solitary confinement for 57 days by myself. What? Every day, yeah. Every day I was questioned, every day I was tortured, every day I was subjected to different uh, 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 horrifying uh, experiences because they wanted me to confess something that it, I did not know what it was. Wow. Uh, so it was a very, very difficult uh, experience in my life. I mean, for somebody who's 19 to be in a solitary confinement for 57 days oh my gosh. without taking a shower or changing my clothes or shaving my beard or cutting my nails, <sighs> not able to be speak to anybody except to the people who are torturing me and interrogating me. It was a very difficult oh experience. God. Wow! And that's where I start questioning even my faith and questioning myself. And that's where I start asking the serious questions. Uh, why this is happening and I wanted to understand why this is happening unfortunately I couldn't make sense of it then but uh, you know it is always very difficult when you see the victim becomes the victimizer right uh, uh, so that's that's part of where I was the victim became the victimizers and you know when the Jews came out of Europe after the Second World War and they came to Palestine, they were accepted and welcomed. Mm. Uh, they were our neighbors. Um, uh, unfortunately, the political climate uh, changed very quickly after the 1948 war. Mm. But when they came before the 1948, everybody gave them land and they lived and they went to each other's weddings. Right. Uh, uh, I remember growing up uh, in, in Bethlehem in my house and my father was... Uh, uh, a carpenter who will do the olive wood carvings, the nativity scenes and the camels and the donkeys. And I will wake up and I see all these Israelis at our house to purchase my father's merchandise wow. to sell it to the tourists. But they will, they will refuse to leave our house till my great-grandmother finished baking the bread in the clay oven so they can eat and take with them. Wow. That's how I grew up. Uh, uh, but things also changed very quickly uh, when the uprising is started. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. I had, yeah, I mean, that's, and, and so you, when you went into, when you were arrested and you were tortured and kidnapped, basically, right? It's kidnapping. Yeah, I was uh, taken out from my bed at three in the morning. And you were religious then? How religious were you at this point? Uh, I just finished my uh, uh, high school when I was 17. It was my second year in college and I was studying at the Bethlehem Bible College preparing my theological education to become a minister. I was so about I to was, say Jesus okay. Christ, not even joking. I was, yeah. I'm not even kidding. That came into my, I just started saying yeah. that and then I realized, yeah. yeah so, so after I finished high school, I really wanted to become uh, a priest. Uh, and I belonged at that time for the Greek Orthodox Church. Oh. Yeah. So I spoke to uh, my priest who uh, took me to Jerusalem to meet with the patriarch. And the patriarch said, well, we don't have money to send you to be educated now. And uh, very soon I became to realize that I wasn't living only under one occupation, which is the Israeli occupation, but I was living under two occupations, the Israeli occupation of Palestine and the Greek occupation mm. of the indigenous Palestinian church. Wow. So here we have a Palestinian church where the whole hierarchy and the whole leadership is Greeks. Wow. Who controlling the money, controlling the properties, controlling the income, uh, stealing everything, and the local indigenous Palestinian church is suffering. Uh, and that's when I decided to leave the Greek Orthodox Church uh, because I it, I couldn't call that church home for me anymore uh, because I felt there's a foreign leadership that it just doesn't care about the suffering and the pain of the Palestinian people. So you were raised Greek Orthodox. Yes. That's what you were brought up in. Yes. And your parents are that also? They still are part of the Greek Orthodox Church, but I lived the Greek Orthodox Church and I joined the Lutheran Church. Okay. And so, the, okay. So you are, you were going to do religious study. You were doing it, but you were started off as part of the Orthodox Church. Then you joined the Lutheran Church. Yes. And then you are kidnapped and arrested, uh, tortured. Where is that in this chronology? Just to get that. That the... was uh, in my second year of college at the Bethlehem Bible College. Okay. So you're already Lutheran at this point? Uh, yes. Wow. Okay. So you, and you went to jail, you suffered all of that and you didn't come out uh, an atheist. You didn't come out a radical, <laughs> um, I don't know, misanthrope. Uh, you didn't embrace violence. I mean, was it hard to, to not do that? I feel like these experiences can either, I guess they reaffirm someone's faith or they can, 
you know, well, kill their I, faith. Yeah, I mean, as I told you, it was really very difficult uh, experience in my life in which, uh, you know, uh, made me question my faith and why this is happening to me and where is God in the midst of all this. But, uh, I mean, I, I very quickly came to realize that the only thing sustaining me in the prison was my faith. Hmm. And the conversation I have with God uh, through my prayers, that's really what sustained me in the prison and kept me strong and kept me going. Uh, because the fact is, because of the torture and the psychological warfare in prison, many people just crash and just say anything to get out of the cell, and they will be sentenced for a year or two, just will sit in a, uh, in a big prison. And I made a commitment to myself. I'm not going to say anything that I haven't done. Uh, and I suffered tremendously because of that decision. But at the end, uh, I was released without being convicted. Wow. And so then you just continued where you left off? I mean, did you need to take time to... Well, you know, after I left the prison, uh, uh, people come and they treat you as a hero uh, because you survived the Israeli prisons. And, you know, many people came and approached me, listen, see what happened to you. Now is the time to resist and to uh, carry arms against Israel. Mm -hmm. And we have to do this and that. And I said, I am not interested in this at all. I am interested in one thing I need to understand and I need to figure out what is happening. And that's really when I started uh, educating myself. Uh, I start researching. I start going to meetings where in Jerusalem, where I knew there is Palestinians and Israelis are meeting and they are talking about issue, difficult issues through dialogue. I became involved. And when I came here in the United States, uh, my church actually held the first dialogue uh, circle to bring Isra Jews and Palestinians uh, together to speak about the conflict in the Middle East. Wow. So what does the conflict in the Middle East have to do with being a council person in New York City? I think my experience over there uh, empowers my commitment to issues of justice and peace. Uh, it empowers my commitment to fight for those who are marginalized and uh, being pushed on the side. Uh, my whole campaign is about bringing people to the middle of the table to make sure everyone is empowered, organized, given a voice, given representation. Uh, I don't want uh, the elected officials that uh, in our district just to deal with the rich and the elite and people who are have uh, s uh, you know they are poor or they uh, hard working families uh, don't have the voice to represent them. So my whole campaign is my campaign is a grassroots campaign. It's a, from the people for the people. Um, I have hundreds of diverse volunteers who come and they are invested in this campaign. They are committed to this campaign. They are stakeholders in this campaign because they want to see there's a strong leadership coming in here to fight for issues of justice, to bring a bold, inclusive voice, to give everyone representation and to make sure everybody is, is given uh, the, the chance. So my, my, cam my campaign is not only about me going to city council, it's, it's a creating a political movement in southwest Brooklyn. It's about engaging people uh, uh, and, and uh, let them uh, come, uh, mobilize them, and, and be engaged in the political process. That's why throughout my campaign we have registered over 600 new voters. Wow. I mean, that is an amazing achievement uh, yeah. that we have been able to do, to engage over 600 new voters in this district. I think that is building political power. And the elected officials who are from the status quo, they have to understand your status quo is not working in this neighborhood and change is coming. So what makes you different from the Democrats you're running against in the primary? Uh, what makes me different is, is really the commitments that I have made in this campaign. First, I made a commitment that I will not take any developer's money. I will not take any corporate lobbyist money. Uh, my campaign is about engaging everyone, involving everyone, empowering everyone, giving everyone a voice. Uh, I am not a career politician. I am not from the establishment, so I will be able to go and stand up uh, when things are not right, and I will support them when they are right. When Mayor de Blasio do something wrong, I will hold him accountable. I will stand and use every, every power I have to make sure uh, he is doing the right thing for the people of uh, our uh, great city. Uh, and that's really what makes me different. Uh, being from outside the establishment who does not owe any favors to anybody, who doesn't have a political post or uh, a, uh, a party that I, or establishment I have to please, I will go as a free person to city council to make the right decisions to serve the people who live in, in the district. 
And it's interesting because you and uh, Jabari Brisport are, have both been endorsed by the Democratic Socialists of America, the DSA. Yes. Um, do you think that there's a why do you think the DSA is taking off so much and socialism in general? When I heard about the DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America, I was really impressed. Uh, I, I felt that the things that I believe in, my convictions, my passion, uh, it, 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 found, it found a home with the DSA. I have been in this district for the past 22 years. I never found a, cl a political club that I can belong to. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the political clubs we have in this district is like exclusive clubs for certain people who look the same way, who speak the same language. It has no diversity. It has no commitment and passion about issues of justice, especially when it comes to economic justice and social justice and racial justice. And, and I felt that DSA is, is a great uh, place where uh, I, I can personally belong, but also they are speaking about relative issues, fighting for everyone in our city. They are not accountable as me to uh, establishment, but they are accountable to the issues of justice and to the people uh, that will benefit from our movement and from our fight. Who made that meme of you or gif on the skateboard? Uh, I have no idea. We received a message from uh, Bob Cabano, who's a, a Republican candidate running in uh, in the primaries, and he wrote about me that I am a leftist, radical Palestinian cleric, and we wanted to respond to him uh, by something radical to say, uh, so we did this, uh, I am on the skateboard uh, pointing at him, and uh, at the end of the video we'll say, uh, radical cleric. Khadr al Yatim for City Council. It's pretty great. He may have inspired one of your best videos. <laughs> it was ironically. a great video. We took the video front of the office, and I'm not sure who worked on it, to be honest with you. So I wanted to respond to him with something radical. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Bob Capano, a fighter for lower taxes and leading Republican City Council candidate for the 43rd District, which is Bay Ridge, Tiger Heights, Bensonhurst, Bath Beach. Today, it called upon the Democrat candidates running for the 43rd Council District seat to denounce the endorsement of their fellow candidate, Palestinian cleric Kader al Yatim, by the New York City Democratic Socialists of America. Capano called the endorsement, quote, a clear signal that al Yatim's political views are out of touch with Brooklyn and the nation, end quote. <laughs> So that that was quite that's a, that's kind of like a great endorsement actually when you it's get fantastic. I'm very proud of that endorsement. Yeah, you should put it on the top of your website. And in terms of endorsements, um, you've been endorsed by New York State Nurses Association, Leona, New York Councilman Carlos Menchaca, Tenants Pack, New Kings Democrats, New York. State Immigrant Action Fund, Muslim Democratic Club of New York, New York City Democratic Socialist, National Institute for Reproductive Health Action Fund. You received a 100% candidate rating from Planned Parenthood Action Fund. Um, yes. League of Independent Theater, that's interesting. Yeah. Small Business <laughs> Congress and Sierra Club. Yeah, so do you do any theater and acting? Well, uh, the reason I, uh, I mean, that was really important uh... Uh, endorsement for me because we in our district we don't have any community centers mm. and I wanted to uh, make sure when I, when I am elected to city council I will open the first community center where we'll bring people who are from different ethnicities different religions where we can be engaged through art and performances and programs and gardening so we can build the bridges and get people to know each other, to know their neighbors, to find a safe place where they can interact. And fortunately, this opportunity is not created in our community, and this community center will be able to bring all of us together. The most important thing to me through this community center is to create the opportunity and the safe place where we can speak about difficult issues uh, in the community, where we can speak about uh, issues that really... Uh, uh, for example, when it comes down to speak about, um, let's say, Planned Parenthood, uh, what they stand for, why we should support them. Uh, when we speak about the LGBTQ community, you know, we have a lot of people who disagree, people who agree, people who don't uh, give the chance to speak about it without being judged. And we need to create these safe places where the community members can come and speak about it. But most importantly, I want to make sure I am bringing the, the long-term residents 
to meet with the new immigrants, to get to engage in a positive conversation, to learn about each other's cultures and language and build and form uh, friendships, instead of us saying, uh, these are new immigrants and everything goes wrong in our uh, community because of these new immigrants. So I think this community center will be vital uh, to uh, the peace and harmony in the community. And what about, um, do you identify as a socialist? Yes, I do. And I'm very proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And when did you start identifying as a socialist? Or when did you discover socialism? Uh, you know, I, I think I always considered myself socialist, but it became official, I think, in uh, I think around February of uh, this year. Mm -hmm. What does socialism mean to you? It's, it's very simple. Socialism is about working hand in hand for the sake of our brothers and sisters to improve their life conditions is is the fact that you are willing to step out of your comfort place and stand in a picket line to defend the worker uh, to to fight for economic justice for those who are less fortunate uh, and uh, to fight for social justice that's really what it means it means it, it socialism it means that we are working very hard to make sure everyone in our city in our world is is being lifted up and taken care of uh, and that's really what it means to me in terms of policies are there any major differences between you and the democrats i mean I, you you explained very well that you are not as beholden to the establishment and to political elites are there any areas in terms of policies or plans or positions where there's a big gap between you and your uh, opponents? I think the biggest difference, uh, I speak about affordable housing. And when I speak about affordable housing, I speak about housing that is affordable to the people who live here. Uh, unfortunately, we, we, we have a lot of people are on the verge of becoming homeless because they cannot afford the rent anymore. So I want to go and fight and bring the funding to our district so we can build affordable housing in our district. Uh, and we want to make sure we are fighting uh, to make sure that taxes don't go up. We have seniors in, in, in our district who lived in their homes for 50 and 60 years. They are finding themselves now they cannot afford to stay in their homes because the tax is going up, water rates are going up, and they are in fixed incomes and saying to me, we can't stay in our home anymore. Hmm. Uh, so so that's, that's number one when it comes to our district, which makes me unique. But also, I am uh, when uh, I believe that when we are when I am elected to city council, every decision we make in city council will impact the life of everyone in the city, not only in my district. That's why I want to make sure when I go to city council, we continue to fight to pass the Right to Know Act, and to make sure we are ending the broken window policing. Can you explain what the Right to Know Act is? The Right to Know Act. There is two sections to it. It's about police accountability. Uh, where police uh, officers uh, will uh, have to identify themselves uh, to uh, any person they stop if that uh, stop does not result in a, an arrest and give them their number, their rank, and everything. But the most important part of that legislation that the police officer must inform uh, the person uh, who is in a car that they have the right to refuse for the, their car to be searched. Mm. I mean, the problem is we see that uh, uh, people of color, immigrants, and documented in our city usually the first target uh, when it comes down to uh, uh, the relationship with the police. And, uh, you know, we have to be truthful to ourselves that uh, there are certain privileges to certain people. So if some person uh, stopped and that person is a black, you might end up in Rikers. And if that same person stopped for the same... Uh, a crime and their skin color is different, they might be let go free. Uh, so, so that's why we're calling on police accountability and ending the broken window policing, passing the right to no act, I think will be a major achievement in, in that way. It was, it's, it, it's interesting, I guess, going back to, looping back to the question of religion and politics, mm -hmm. it was really moving to see Bernie Sanders talk at Riverside Church where Martin Luther King had of course delivered his Beyond Vietnam speech. Yep. Um, have you ever have you been to Riverside Church in the past? Yes, many times. Yeah, it's really pretty moving. There's so many people who use religion in a kind of 
reactionary, bigoted way or to justify reactionary, bigoted politics. Do you ever find people who are just um, turned off by religion or don't trust religious leaders because of the way that religion has often been kind of abused? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I am sometimes turned off by religion <laughs> when I see uh, the white supremacists, the KKK and the neo-Nazis using religion in a way to uh, hate people and victimize people and uh, be racist. Right. Uh, that, that's when I'm turned off by religion. Right. Uh, even when I look at what's happening in the Middle East, where ISIS and Al Qaeda use religion to uh, commit their acts of violence against innocents, and and the victims of their crimes actually are mostly Muslims, not even Christians or Jews. Uh, so, so religion right. is religion is is uh, to me is is a, a beautiful thing to empower us to be bold in our relationship to the other. It's it is. It is a beautiful thing to allow us to feel the pain of the other and to work uh, uh, to help others. That's really religion, what it's uh, to me. Otherwise, uh, religion is, is uh, outside of this. I'm not sure if it has any meaning. Mm. Why is, is religion important to you? Like, what is it about the, the teachings of Jesus Christ that are important to not just someone who believes in Jesus Christ, but to everyone? Well, my whole understanding of my Christian faith is my relationship to the other. So my faith empowers me to step outside of my comfort, to step outside of my identity so I can connect and see the identity of the other. Uh, it is about knowing who is the other, feeling their pain, hearing their story, understanding their context, and how we can work together to improve the uh, human life's condition. So I, I look at Jesus as the biggest socialist in the world who worked mm -hmm. for uh, social justice, who wanted to bring economic justice. And uh, I, I take my message as an empowerment to be able to fight for issues of justice and to stand on the side of those who are victimized, those who are uh, harassed, those who are facing domestic violence or hate crimes or racist uh, 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 anti-discriminatory -disc uh, crimes. So, so my faith really empowers me to be able to do things that uh, otherwise I would not be able to do without having a confidence uh, that I am doing something good for the sake of helping my neighbor. Right. Yeah, it's kind of what's the point of it. Yeah. Um, and have you been back to Bethlehem? Uh, you know, I uh, go uh, every three years, four years, but it is a very difficult trip. Uh, you know, I am an American citizen, uh, but Israel mm -hmm. does not recognize my American citizenship. Mm. Uh, so I am not allowed to use my American passport to travel to Israel. Um, uh, so what I have to do is travel from here to Jordan, and then I have to travel from Jordan to the uh, Palestinian territories through land. And when I go there, uh, I have to use only my Palestinian uh, travel document. Mm. Yeah, so which just makes it a little bit tough. By the way, I put out on Twitter, I said, um, I'm chatting with you, and I said, does anyone have any questions? Uh -huh. And James Zogby oh. <laughs> wrote, no questions, but tell him I think he's great. <laughs> Thank you. So that's nice. And what do people need to do to um, support you right now? Well, uh, you know, we have been working for the past eight months nonstop, and it has been so exciting. It's phenomenal. Uh, we have hundreds of diverse volunteers who come and volunteer with us. Uh, the DSA has done incredible uh, job to uh, uh, bring their volunteers here. Uh, so we need people to come out on September 12th and volunteer for us to make sure we get uh, people to go out and vote. So my, my one ask uh, for everyone who is listening to us today is take September 12th off. Come to the district. Get engaged, get involved, help us get the votes out, and let's make things happen. Great. You have four kids, right? Yes. And uh, you have how many dogs? One dog. A Yorkie. Max is his uh, name? My favorite, Max. How old is he? He just turned four uh, in July. Oh, my gosh. I'm, it's my birthday, too. Oh. July, it's 7-11, July 11th. Uh, here you um, go. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This was really great. I could oh, keep great. talking forever. Oh, but... this is, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Great. Thank, thank you. you. You're listening to The Katie Halper Show on WBAI. Don't forget that we count on your support to bring you our weekly shows. 
to do that, just go to patreon.com slash the Katie Halper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Halper Show. That was our interview with Kadir El Yatim, who is running for city council. To find out more about Reverend Kader El Yatim, please go to El Yatim. 2017.com. That's Elyatim 2017.com. That is E L Y A T E E M 2017. Reverend Elyatim is a supporter of single payer, by the way. And speaking of which, now we bring you our health care debate. John Conyers' Medicare for All bill has 115 Democratic sponsors in the House. And next week, Senator Bernie Sanders will be presenting his own Senate version. But what exactly is Medicare for All? And is it the best way to achieve universal health care coverage? To find out, I invited on two special guests, Dr. Adam Gaffney and Mr. Joshua Holland. And this is our Katie Halper Show debate, some hot left-on-left action. And we are speaking to Adam Gaffney and Joshua Holland. Adam Gaffney is a writer, instructor at Harvard Medical School, a pulmonary and critical care doctor, and a single-payer advocate with Physicians for a National Health Care Plan. He writes for places like Jacobin and The Guardian. So really what we're talking about now is politics and about some of the policy details um, of how to actually achieve the goal of universal health care. Joshua Holland is a Nation Institute fellow, and he writes for places like The Nation and Rolling Stone. And he's the host of Politics and Reality Radio. Those advocating a rapid transition of everybody into a single-payer health care program are ignoring what I think is the biggest obstacle, which is the public. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Katie. Thanks for having us, Katie. Yeah, of course. So you both wrote pieces about Medicare for All, and you guys kind of had opposing theses, I would say. So... Josh, your piece, which was in The Nation, is titled, Medicare for All Isn't the Solution for Universal Health Care. The health care debate is moving to the left, but if progressives don't start sweating the details, we're going to fail yet again. Adam, on the other hand, you wrote a piece called, Medicare for All Should Be a Litmus Test. Don't believe the critics. Medicare for All is the most realistic way to win universal, equitable health care. Now, okay, and that was a Jacobin. I wanted to do a test. An intellectual exercise and also an exercise in understanding and dialogue. What if each of you explained the other one's arguments and then got into the debate? But make the best case as if you, Josh, were Adam and Adam, you were Josh. Or you were arguing for what Josh was arguing and you were arguing for what Adam was arguing. (laughs) (laughs) This comes from like like debate training 101. Is this really like, obvious? Is I this... feel like we're getting a little dirty hippie ish here. Well, I mean, do we need to sing Kumbaya? Well, here, let me tell you why. I mean, this is the Kumbaya. I was just going to go straight for the jugular, but I can do it. I, I mean, I will sing Kumbaya, <laughs> by the way. I'm not denigrating. I'm not singing anything. <laughs> I had a you debate don't want me to sing. last year. I had a debate about uh, Bernie versus Hillary among women, like, you know, the feminist oh, debate. God. And I started out by having each of the women participating tell me a good thing for the person that they were opposing. In other words, like I actually had Amanda Marcotte say why Bernie was a good choice. And I had, you know, Sarah uh, Leonard say why Hillary was a good choice. And it was just interesting. Now, if you... But Katie, we're white men. We're, we're socialized for aggression. I know. Well, so are some of the women on the on the panel, including my, <laughs> including myself. Um, no, Katie, you're so conciliatory. You never fight with yeah, anybody. You know, in I've, real life, I've never seen it. In real life, I am. I've never. S- <laughs> I I avoid conflict. I I, I appreciate your pugilistic style, actually. But it's not just pugilistic. I know. Uh, it's become more and more. Well. Anyway, so you guys don't like my idea. I mean, we could, I, you know, we could reduce the debate down to the nub of it. Also, because I'm happy to stipulate that single payer is superior and that, you know, if if I were a benevolent dictator for a day, there's no question that I would enact Medicare for all and just stick everybody in it. Yeah. So we don't really have to debate that piece. Of so it. you're saying on a moral, ethical level, you agree that Medicare for all is the best. 
but your critique is strategic. Why don't I? Why don't I just kind of like throw out my? All right, fine. Like a, a little bit of my thesis, or, or I mean, if nah, you want to do this, Adam, if you don't I mean, want to do it. I mean, I can I can summarize Josh's argument. It's up to you, or we can just summarize our own arguments. I don't know. It's up to you. You two decide. I mean, I kind of think that you know you you're. By the way, Adam wrote the best critique of my piece um, out there, but I think that you missed. I, I think that you did not address a really central. Um, I believe that Medicare for All is terrific politics, and I believe that there are a number of different ways to get to something that we could call a single-payer system. Single-payer is kind of a fuzzy term, um, but and, I, and I've noticed since I wrote this piece that a lot of people who are single-payer advocates, I mean, not, not wonky advocates, but just regular lefty activist types who say they demand single-payer actually want... Um, universal health care, comprehensive universal health care, and are not as concerned about how you get there as uh, as one might think. That's been something that, that I've, uh, an interesting revelation, and people have actually accused me of um, a straw man in suggesting that people are set on, on Medicare, a rapid transition to Medicare for all. Anyway, um, my belief is that all of the obstacles that others talk about, feckless Democrats, um, healthcare industry stakeholders, the insurance industry, are going to be exactly as uh, great an obstacle as, as, as others believe. But I believe that the left is also um, those advocating a rapid transition of everybody into a single payer healthcare program are ignoring what I think is the biggest obstacle, which is the public. And um, what, what I talk about in peace is this idea of loss aversion. People value something that they have more than they value something that they might get. Even if that thing is superior, um, there is another, another phenomenon known as status quo bias. Uh, people are afraid of change, especially rapid change. The more rapid, the more resistance you'll get. Um, and I think that there are ways to get to something that, that might be called single payer that avoid some of these pitfalls. And if we bite it all off in one chunk, we are basically going to fail. That's a nutshell of my argument. Okay. And so for you, Adam, misses the loss um, aversion and the status quo bias? Well, so in, in Adam's piece, which again was, I thought, the best critique of my piece, he explains why single payer Medicare for all, as it's on the table in the Conyers bill, would be superior, would give people better benefits. And then he says, who wouldn't want that? So uh, he posits that this would be a rational conversation. And he kind of wishes away my arguments about loss aversion as, as if people are politically rational about these choices when loss aversion is actually irrational. and. Um, it's not something that I made up. It's a very well-established psychological principle. I had in an earlier draft of the piece that got cut for length, I talked about some experiments. Um, a very famous one was they gave people $50 and they said, you can keep $30 or you can take a 50-50 gamble and you get to keep it all or, or lose it all. And um, a minority of respondents or, or subjects decided to take that gamble. And when they changed the wording from you can keep $30 to you can lose $20, which is the same amount of money, the number of people who wanted to gamble went up significantly because they were so, this uh, the idea of loss triggered something in them. They acted differently. And of course, the rational you know, the rational response to a 50-50 chance of getting $25 or 100% chance of getting $30 is you keep the $30. So this, just changing the wording caused a, a dramatic change in people's behavior. Um, another example is they ask people to value an object uh, and they'd say like, oh, I think it's worth about $5. And then later in the experiment, they gave them that object and they asked how much they would have to uh, be given to to lose it how much you know how much do you want for it and their valuation of it significantly increased when they owned it 
So th this is not something that I just made up. It's not rational. It is what it is. And the other point that I, I'd make, and I'll turn this over to Adam in a second, is that we've just seen such a clear example of that with the Affordable Care Act process. Um, the Affordable Care Act, for all its flaws, extended health coverage to 15 times as many people as lost policies, quote unquote lost policies. About 1.5 million people were unable to keep their policy, um, you know, contrary to Obama's famous promise. And those people became a huge scandal and really the, just a centerpiece of the, op of the opposition, um, even though those policies were by and large substandard uh, catastrophic care policies that wouldn't even cover them if they got sick. And most of those people were able to get more comprehensive coverage with subsidies that, that ended up making it a wash. So in any rational universe, these 1.5 million so-called victims of Obamacare shouldn't have been a big deal. But the idea of losing coverage is a really big deal. Okay. All right. So a lot of points wrapped into one, in, 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 into what Josh has said. Let me just say at the outset that I do think that me and Josh are arguing um, or we believe in, from a moral perspective, the same long-term goal of creating a right to health care in this country. And it seems like we agree on even the policy merits of single payer. Um, so really what we're talking now, talking about now is politics and about some of the policy details um, of how to actually achieve the goal of universal health care. Um, I think one thing that's important to say right now is that Josh misses a very larger problem in the U.S. healthcare system. We're not just talking about the uninsured. 9% of the country right now remains uninsured in the age of the Affordable Care Act, 28.6 million, according to the National Health Interview Survey last year. That is a serious problem. I think we can both agree that is something we need to deal with, we have to deal with, and it's morally imperative that we deal with as soon as possible. We can't, ha we can't ha leave all these people without health care coverage in any decent society. But that's not the only problem. OK, multiple there are multiple other serious shortcomings in the American healthcare care system and nothing that Josh says would deal with everybody else is problems. So, for instance, people who are getting their insurance through their employers, the Kaiser Health Family Foundation has um, estimated that they've had a 300 percent increase in the dollar value of their deductible over the last decade. People are being hit with co-payments, deductibles, co-insurance that are squeezing their finances, that are making it difficult to avoid health to, to attain health care, that are making them defer health care, and that are squeezing um, you know household finances in a serious way. Uh, prescription, I mean, prescription drugs is a whole other issue. Maybe it's not fair to, to 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 go into that right now, but that's another area that does need to be addressed, and a single payer system would address it, whereas um, the incremental approaches would not. Um, there are even problems with Medicare. I mean, Medicare even though I'm the one advocating for Medicare for all system, we're talking about expanded and improved Medicare. I think there are problems with Medicare. It also leaves people with too much health care expenditures um, um, out of pocket, um, as well as excludes important benefits. So before we get into some of the nitty gritty about the loss aversion things, and I want to respond to all of Josh's points, I think it's important that we realize that we have a slightly different philosophical orientation towards this whole thing. Many of us in the Medicare for All movement are aiming at improving the healthcare system for everybody in the population, almost everyone, not only the uninsured. We care about the uninsured, and that's critical, and that's central, but there's other important things that we need to do. And unlike the incremental approaches, Medicare for All, expanded and improved Medicare for All, has the capacity to improve health care for the vast majority of the country. Um, so that's one point I want to make at the outset. Now, regarding loss aversion, um, there's something actually very important that I think we – can learn from Josh's article, which is that he is right. If we establish a single payer system in which the single payer plans are inferior to current employer based plans, we will have a problem on our hands. Okay, if we are talking about moving the entirety of employer sponsored covered co co people with employer sponsored coverage into a plan that's uh, that, that's inferior, as he does suggest in the article, um, that is going to be politically um, insurmountable potentially. So we absolutely need to design a single payer system without. Um, cost sharing, in my opinion. I think that that will be an enormous selling point for all the people that Josh are talking about. If people learn that they're going to obtain a plan without co-payments or deductibles, that is going to be an enormously strong argument for them to favor uh, being transitioned and, and accepting a Medicare for All system. 
Let me also speak to a couple other reasons why I think the loss of version argument is not really the right one. Um, not only in a, in a Medicare for all system, not only would people not have cost sharing, according to the HR 676 bills, as well as what I believe will be in Sanders upcoming bill, um, there also be the end of insurance networks. Uh, people don't like being told what doctor they have to go to, what hospital they have to go to. We talk a lot about choice, but people don't have choice today. They have insurer choice, but they don't have actual choice in their doctors. So under a Medicare for all system, we'd eliminate networks. We'd have one big network so that people could actually choose their doctor in the hospital. I think that would provide a very compelling, very compelling, meaningful arguments for people to want Medicare for all as opposed to incremental approaches or opposed to keeping their current plan. Um, the third uh, thing I'd say in response to Josh mentioning that, you know, people who were on the, who had in the ACA, when they, we into the ACA, some people lost their, their existing plans. And as Josh mentioned, that created a whole political stir, but I don't think the ar the argument is really fair. The reality is, is that those people essentially had their premiums go up. Now they were, as Josh said, getting much better plans. The Affordable Care Act required, had better, more requirements uh, for coverage, 10 essential health benefits, etc. The plans that they had were basically catastrophic plans. I think from some people's perspectives, all they saw was their, their premiums go up and they weren't really thinking 30 down year, 30 years down the road where they might have more expenses and they might actually benefit from this transition. But from their perspective, they just saw premiums rising and they thought that it was something bad. Um, look, it's going to be a massive fight no matter what. There's going to be a lot of resistance. No matter what you do, we're going to be going up against the insurers, the pharmaceutical companies. The right-wing media is going to spin it like crazy. We're going to be called everything in the book. There's no, this isn't going to be easy no matter how you, no matter how you approach it. The reality is, though, is that – and I'll, and I'll go, go, go back to Josh now. The reality is, is that only a Medicare for All system would improve health care for everybody. And it's important that we improve health care for everybody because we need to have a huge coalition to coalesce together in order to see something this big happen. And I think that this could be an important rallying cry for Democrats as well. It's going to be part of a larger political project because it includes everyone and potentially would help everyone. You're listening to The Katie Halper Show on WBAI. To hear the rest of this debate between Adam Gaffney and Josh Holland, please become Patreon supporters. To do that, just go to patreon.com slash The Katie Halper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash The Katie Halper Show. Adam is a single-payer advocate, a member of Physicians for National Healthcare Plan, you can find out more about Adam at his website, theprogressivephysician.net, and follow him on Twitter at A.W. Gaffney. That's A-W-G-A-F-F-N-E-Y. Joshua Holland, follow Josh on Twitter at J-O-S-H-U-A-H-O-L. He's a contributor to The Nation and Rolling Stone, and he's the host of Politics and Reality Radio. And of course... Follow me on Twitter at KT Helps. That's letter K, letter T, H A L P S. Follow Gabe at Gabe underscore Pacheco. And use the hashtag KT Helps Show. That's letter K, letter T, H A L P S H O W. And we'll see you Monday, September 18th at our live taping of the KT Helper Show at the Brooklyn Commons, 388 Atlantic Avenue at 7 p.m. with our special guest, Jabari Brisport, running for city council. Thanks for listening to the Katie Helper Show. Make sure to tune in next Wednesday at 7 p.m. on WBAI for another great episode. You can also find us on SoundCloud and iTunes where you can rate and review us. Don't forget that we count on your support to bring you our weekly shows. To do that, just go to patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. The Katie Halper Show is produced by Florence Burrow Adams and Joshua Bregman. Our theme song is by The Ballet. Thanks for listening.